good morning, Matros Church. Let us stand to our feet as able and get ready to praise the Lord together this morning in spirit and truth here together Sunday. All right, let's sing it. Whoa. is empowering the kingdom of the lord is within me and it's calling me to the heavenly to be seated in heavenly places oh just like heaven just like heaven on earth to be walking in his favor and graces just like heaven children is to demonstrate the perpetuate be seen in heavenly places oh, just like heaven just like heaven on earth to be walking in his favor and graces just like heaven just like heaven on earth Heaven on earth, sing it. Something's moving, something's changing. See his glory, feels like heaven on earth. Something's moving, something's changing. See his glory, feels like heaven on earth. Something's moving, something's changing. See his glory, feels like heaven on earth. There is a lightning and the sound of many waters, heaven on earth, say it! Welcome to Together Sunday. I am so thankful that you are here. Let us glorify the Lord together. Now, that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to glorify the Lord together. So uh, I think that is going to involve several things. One, it's going to involve some singing, so I, I can tell you're already in the mood for that, and that's working out okay for you. Uh, it's also going to involve uh, some thinking and some challenging, and then somewhere along the way, we're going to make some commitments uh, to help some folks who might really need our help. And so I am so grateful that you are here. But I realize this, 
if this is going to happen today, it's because you're going to give back some energy and you're going to be in this space. So to get that started, I want to be sure you know who you're worshiping with. I want to be sure you meet some people you haven't met in six services on a weekend, two campuses. There are people here you don't even know you go to church with. So would you take a minute, let's turn up the lights, and you guys greet each other and make sure everybody feels welcome. Continue to worship together. Put your hands together as we sing the cross before me. The cross before me, the world behind. No turning back, raise a banner high. It's not for me, it's all for you. Let the heavens shake and split the sky. Let the people clap their hands and cry. It's not for us. It's all for you. For you, yeah. Not to us. To your name be the glory. Not to us. But to your name be the glory, yeah. hearts on full before your throne the only place for those who know it's not for us it's all for you send your holy fire on this offering let our worship burn for the world to see it's not for us it's all for you for you yeah not to us, to your name be glory. Not to us, to your name be glory. So good, so good to me, Jesus. We respond. So good, so good. 
so so good to me. So good, so so good to me. So good, so so good to me. Jesus, I waited patiently upon the Lord, and He inclined and heard my cry. He pulled me up out of the fiery clay. He set my feet upon the rock. He gave me beautiful ashes and joy for my morning and praise for happiness. He put a new song in my mouth and a crown upon my head. He gave me life forevermore. I sing it out. So good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me, Jesus. You've been so good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me. So good, so, so good to me, Jesus. Oh, you pick me up and you turn me around and you place my feet on the solid ground. Hallelujah. That's it, guys. Sing that again. Cause you pick me up and you turn me around And you place my feet on the solid ground Hallelujah Sing it Hallelujah Alright, come on ladies Cause you pick me up and you turn me around And you place my feet on the solid ground Hallelujah Oh, hallelujah One more time Cause you pick me up and you turn me around Bring life 
Jesse. Let's pray. Lord, today we confess that we need you. We are broken people and we need you, Lord. We rely upon ourselves and we don't easily trust you to work in our lives. But Lord, today we ask for your forgiveness. Forgive us of our selfishness. Forgive us of not allowing you to work fully in our lives. Lord, forgive us for the times that we have not shown love to our family and friends. Forgive us for when we have not shown love to others in our world because of race and culture and language or maybe their belief. Lord, we present ourselves into your hands and we acknowledge that there is no one greater than you. Would you work in our lives? Will you fill us? Will you empower us with your Holy Spirit to love as you have loved us? For Lord, there is no greater love than your love. Nobody greater, nobody greater, nobody greater than you, Lord. Nobody greater, nobody greater, nobody greater than you. Lord, today we celebrate your work in our family and our congregation. Lord, we thank you for having a healthy place to worship where we can connect and we can belong. But Lord, we plead before you that we need you in our lives corporately. Bless our families with a deep sense of your abiding love. Will you bless our friendships so that we can experience authentic trust and accountability? Lord, bless our workplaces so that we can glorify you with gifts that you have given us. And Lord, bless our congregation. Bless Pastor Dave and the staff that we may seek together uh, with our whole heart to find a place of belonging where we are empowered by your Holy Spirit to love our world. Lord, would you bless our partners in ministry in the city and around the world. Bless those in Swaziland. Bless the mothers and babies and staff at Elizabeth House. Lord, bless our kids and our staff at our STARS program. Bless Pastor Tony and the members of Central City in Skid Row, Los Angeles. Would you bless our friends at Tierra del Sol and Special Olympics. Lord, would you just bless all the partners in a way that they would see your love through us as we give and as we volunteer. May we love as you have loved us, for Lord, there is no greater love than your love. Nobody greater, no. finally intercede for the world in which we live. Those who have no knowledge or experience with your love, we pray that you would use us, you'd use our hands and our minds and our resources. Lord, give us compassion for those who suffer from hunger and poverty and help us to live for justice. Lord, give us peace where there is division and racism and hatred and help us to live for unity. Lord, would you give us empathy for those with whom we disagree and help us to live for understanding. And Lord, would you give us vision to radically reflect your love to a hurting and broken world and help us to love as you have loved us. For Lord, there is no greater love than your love. We thank you, Lord.
wow. Is that a biblical word? Wow. That was awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for being here on Together Sunday. We're in this thing together. There are no Lone Rangers, right? We are in this thing together. In 2000, January 2000, I became the pastor at Pasadena Brzee Church in Pasadena. Yeah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and uh, Bonnie and I served faithfully alongside some wonderful people. But about 12 years into it, we realized that we just did not have the resources, the financial resources, the people resources. And that congregation that had been in Pasadena since 1919 had to make the hard decision to close. And we made that decision, but almost before we could say amen in our prayer, we heard a rumor that Montrose Church, under the leadership of Pastor Dave, had a heart for assimilating a congregation into Montrose. And before we knew it, we were assimilated into the Montrose story, and suddenly we were together. One church, two campuses, doing an awesome thing. And totally unbeknownst to me, I thought I was going to retire because I was an old guy anyway. So, and then Pastor Dave said, would you consider coming on staff? And I thought, All right, I, you know, I pray, dear, yeah, I will do that. And I'll do that. And so here we are. But you know what? Great ideas will never happen if key people don't sign on and make them happen. And on the Pasadena side of things, there is a couple that I want to introduce to you, Jim and Fran Hastings. Would you guys stand? And just keep standing. They, they, I'll get a big lecture after this is over for making them stand, but I can take it. They came to Pasadena College. They didn't know each other. They came to Pasadena College in 1953. Pasadena is now Point Loma, Nazarene University. But at the time, <laughs> it was uh, Pasadena College, and it was right up the street from Pasadena Brzee Church. And uh, Jim and friends started worshiping there. They began dating, I think your freshman or sophomore year, somewhere in there. Anyway, they worshiped for the four years of college. As soon as they graduated, the day after they graduated, they were married in our chapel. And uh, they have been in Pasadena Brzee Church since 1953, 64 years in that congregation. And when we made the decision, when the decision was made for Montrose to come in and assimilate us into them, some of the best cheerleaders of that effort were Jim and Fran. Hastings. And I just want, we wanted to honor them. In fact, the last Sunday of June, we honored their 60th wedding anniversary. And then uh, we also just uh, dedicated the lounge at Pasadena Brzee to them. If you've not seen the lounge, it's worth a trip over there just to see it. Anyway, we renamed that lounge Hastings Lounge. So when you go in there, you'll see a little plaque that says that. But we did it for two reasons. We come out of a history, but we are looking forward to what lies ahead. And because of people like Jim and Fran Hastings, uh, that dream has materialized, and they have been a vital voice in all that is going on. And today, I just want to ask you, if you will, to honor them and to thank them for being a part of that transition. Thank you, Jim and Fran. I hope you guys are getting a sense as we sit here together that we are caught up in a story that is so much bigger than ourselves. And isn't that a good feeling 
to know that we're a part of so much, something so much greater, to think about 64 years of dedication, of opening your home and inviting people in and, uh, and encouraging discipleship. And that's how we grow in God's character, isn't it? Is when we are surrounded by people uh, who believe and can hold us accountable. And we want to create more space for that. And that's why we do life groups. We believe that as a church, uh, to grow in God's character and to impact the world, uh, we need to be surrounding ourselves with people who know us and who follow us on our journey and uh, who we can check in on and care for. And that's why we do life groups. And we want to make it really easy for you to get involved. And that's why this Thursday at 6 o'clock, I want to invite all of you to come to our life groups dinner. We're going to have a catered meal and live music and roundtable discussion. And you can learn more about life groups, which are uh, small groups of people who uh, usually follow the sermon series and talk about how it's impacting their lives and, uh, and who make a difference in each other's lives by being present. And so I would encourage you guys to come on Thursday night to, do to join in that. Also, there's lots of other ways to get involved and to get connected this fall. Uh, there's a special insert in your bulletin that you can look at all those things. I don't have uh, space to go through all of those things, but they're right there in your bulletin so you can get involved. And, uh, and I hope you'll do that. Also, raise your hand. If you've gone to Swaziland before on one of our trips, can you raise your hand? It's hard to see out there. But look around and see if you can see somebody with their hand raised. And sometime today, go up and ask them their story about how that changed their life. Um, we want you to be involved in our next trip this summer, this June. Pastor Dave is going to be leading a trip down there uh, where we are going to be partnering with the church and, uh, and making an impact in that community across the world. And so if you're interested in that, we have an informational meeting on October 10th at 7 p.m. And uh, you can learn more about that. Um, and I would like to ask our, our children to come forward at this time. Could I have the children come forward? And we want to recognize you as you come down. And come on down. Look at all these kids. All these children. That is actually a lot of kids. Look at that. Wow. Is there room enough for you guys up here? Come on up. Okay, you guys ready for the song that we prepared today? Ready and... I'm just kidding. We don't have any song prepared. Um, you guys are going to follow uh, those balloons right there. You guys are going to follow out the back of the service all together. And would you guys honor the kids? Thanks, thank them for sitting through the service and hanging out with us. Great. All right. At this point, as the kids leave, um, I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward, and we're going to pray for our tithes and offerings. Later this, uh, in the service, you're going to have an opportunity to, uh, to make a commitment to our faith promise, and you're going to be learning more about that. Uh, but I would like to invite our ushers to come forward, and we're going to pray for our tithes and offerings. God, we are so grateful being here. Uh, we are surrounded by people who know and believe that there is a God who cares for us, who loves us, and who draws us together, and who's given us everything we need to thrive in you and to, to live a full life. And so, God, we thank you for that. We are so grateful for all you have given us, and we give back to you uh, in gratitude. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> I want you to sing along with me. This is my father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings, and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world, I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, His hand the wonders run. It's God in my living there in my breathing, God in my waking, God in my sleeping, God in my resting, there in my working, God in my thinking, 
God in my speaking. Christ in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. You are everything. Christ in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. You are everything. As God in my hoping, is there in my dreaming, God in my watching, God in my waiting, God in my laughing. Is there in my weeping? Oh, God, in my hurting, God, in my healing, be my everything, be my everything, be my everything, be my everything. everything. This is my Father's world. Won't let me ne'er forget That though the wrong seems oft so strong God is the ruler yet This is my Father's world The battle is not done shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm hit by this impression right now. We all desire certain outcomes in our lives. We all have things that we would ask God to do or change or make different. But you and I don't get to choose that, do we? And if we're very, very honest we would admit that we wouldn't really know exactly what to do to get the outcome that we want. I mean, we, we think we do. We act like we do. We get angry like we do. We, we get arrogant like we do. We tell people what they ought to do in order to get the outcome we desire. But Jim and friends, I, I assume that you didn't dream of having a lounge named after you. <laughs> you might not want to Google, you know, the Hastings Lounge. I'm not sure what you would get. <laughs> Probably nothing to do with Pasadena Brazil campus. <laughs> no, you just show up week after week and you do what you do. You just love people and, you know wipe kids' noses in Sunday school and tell Bible stories and take the offering and shake somebody's hand and have somebody to dinner. And and God is in those details. God is in those little things. And, And while you and I, we try to figure out how to change the outcomes, the scripture again and again calls us to this. Do what you do today. Do what's in front of you right now. Don't try to figure it all out. That's, that'll wear you out. That will make you tired. Just today, love somebody. In fact, love each other the way I've loved you. And in these weeks, as we've journeyed together and we've talked about how Jesus loved through the layers of his relationships, he loved in partnership and in friendship and in discipleship. Love the broken, which is all of us. 
But then we think just for a minute about how did he love the crowd? How did he love the masses? And I, and I think, here's a couple of things I know here as I start to share with you. Number one, um, you've been around a while, maybe, maybe this is your first time. If you're not, if you're first time, let me give you a disclaimer right here. I am odd. <laughs> and, and I have a microphone. So I'm going to share some oddness, and I hope you get it, but you may not. But here's the thing. If you think it's super weird and you don't get it, I like it. <laughs> and I have the mic. But I just made this observation a few weeks ago when I was thinking about this weekend and praying about it. You know, Jesus teaches us some things that are very basic. I mean, they're not, they're not super, super difficult for us to grasp, and they're not about Christianity per se. They're about, you know, you do realize how that happened. You, Jesus taught, and then later on we called it Christianity as in imitating what Jesus taught. You understand? <laughs> and so some of the things that Jesus teaches us are so fundamental and so basic to humanity that, that you really would have to push back beyond Jesus' teaching into the whole Jewish tradition, and, and you'd find the same principles at work. You'd find the same ideas but if you push just a little further than that, what you would find is that, that, that as you go back historically to the old, very oldest formational kind of writings in, in human history, Hammurabi's Code and, and some of the very oldest law and structure and formation of what's valuable in humanity, what matters to humankind, then you would find that those are the themes that Jesus teaches. Those are the things he talks about most. He, he talks about these things. So therefore, it would not be surprising to find out that these very basic fundamental things, these things that have so much to do with what it means to be a fulfilled, meaningful, likable, lovable human being on the planet Earth, that these ideas infiltrate lots of things. They show up in lots of places. And, and so as I was thinking about that, I realized that, that as we talk about, you know, humanity and mankind and the crowd, I seem to remember and recall a little exchange of conversation that it seems like articulates profoundly what Jesus taught us. So it happens to occur in an old story uh, by a man named Charles Dickens, and it happens to be a ghost story, and it happens to uh, involve this specific conversation a conversation with a ghost named Jacob Marley. So if you can, on the Sunday morning uh, at the end of September, when you probably haven't started yet to think about it, let's enjoy a little Christmas. <laughs> Mercy, he said, dreadful apparition, why do you trouble me? Man of the worldly mind, replied the ghost, do you believe in me or not? I do, said Scrooge, I must. But why do spirits walk the earth and why do they come to me? It is required of every man, the ghost returned, that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide. And if that spirit goes not forth in life, it is condemned to do so after death. It is doomed to wander through the world. Oh, woe is me, and witness what it cannot share, but might have shared on earth, and turn to happiness. Again, the specter raised a cry and shook its change and wrung its shadowy hands. You're fettered, said Scrooge, trembling. Tell me why. I wear the chain I forged in life, replied the ghost. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on my own free will, and of my own free will I wore it. Is its pattern strange to you? Scrooge trembled more and more. Or would you know, pursued the ghost, the weight and length of the strong coil you bear yourself. It was full as heavy and as long as this seven Christmas Eves ago. You've eight labored on it since. It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some 50 or 60 fathoms of iron cable, but he could see nothing. Jacob, he said imploringly, old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of people. 
nor can I tell you what I would. A very little more is all permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house. Mark me. In life, my spirit never rode beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hole. And weary journeys lie before me. Oh, captive bound and double ironed, cried the phantom, not to know that ages of incessant labor by immortal creatures for this earth must pass into eternity before the good of which it is susceptible is developed. Not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of a regret can make amends for one's life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I, oh, such was I. But you were always a good person of business, Jacob, faltered Scrooge, who now began to apply this to himself. Business, cried the ghost, wringing his hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. I believe those are the compelling truths that Jesus taught us. I think it's fascinating to me that, that Charles Dickens would, would be so passionately involved in trying to help you and me understand what is most important about this life. But not just about this life, but about eternity. That, that somehow, today as we gather in this place and we call it Together Sunday and, and, and we think about some things that matter, that we would genuinely be changed because we are genuinely distracted. Amen? We have a very difficult time, all of us, believing that our business is humankind. Our business is not creating comfort for ourselves. Our business is not being successful in our work. Our, our, our business is not building things that honor us. Our business is to make the world a better place to live. Our business is to be the kind of people in the context of our homes and relationships that bring with them a piece of hope and light and heaven, heaven on earth. Our business is to create somehow practice and formation within the context of our inner worlds so that what we experience in here is something that locks us in relationship to a loving Heavenly Father and informs our journey of life and hope and peace and joy and gentleness and self-control. That's our business. But I'm guessing for a lot of us, we struggle. We struggle for that to be true of us. So we think just for a little bit this morning about what it means to love as Jesus loved. I don't know about you, but I find it easy to love in concept and much easier to love in practicality. I love humankind, but people bother me a little. <laughs> and I'm surprised at how easily we do that. I mean, I don't know about you, but I, I, for most of us, and for me included, I, I find it quite simple to, to talk about conceptually loving and then to criticize. Anybody else? I find it quite easy on one plane philosophically to talk about the love of God and, you know, we are one, kumbaya. And then in the same breath, to be nasty to someone, to, to say words about, if it's like we have, we have agreed together to create layers of our lives and conceptually we want to love people the way Jesus loved them but practically we'd like to kick them in the pants just me 
And it feels like that ought not be. It feels like maybe if we, if we are looking for an outcome of a loving world, we will never get it if our daily steps involve criticism and judgment. I want to warn you, there is no second service today. <laughs> I have no motivation to hurry. <laughs> I, I mean, we want loving homes, but we don't want to behave in loving ways. And then we ask ourselves a question, why isn't my home more loving? We want loving communities, but we critique, we criticize, we, we judge, we, we talk about what it ought to be, we tear things down. We're good at it. We're experts. We want great schools for our children. We talk bad about their teachers. Well whole school district really well the whole system well the whole education in America really <laughs> amen we want to raise loving children but we critique them instead of build them up <laughs> I think we like the theory of loving people it's the practicality that we struggle with it it gives us all kinds of problems that gnaws at our brains we're so busy analyzing and figuring out and offering up our opinions we so willingly self-righteously tear down instead of build up it's a tough one we do it in our personal relationships we judge we pick sides we act out we punish we seek restitution all in the name of our belief that we are right and other people are wrong and we know, because God likes us better. It speaks right into the heart of the biblical warning that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. We really do love to critique. I think we love to critique things because uh, we have a level of anxiety. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to hear Benjamin uh, Zander speak. Uh, anybody know Benjamin Zander? He's the uh, conductor of the Boston Philharmonic. Um, and uh, he got up to speak and he said, I'm going to speak for two hours, which I always think is a dangerous thing for a speaker to say up front. <laughs> so he began to share. He wrote a great book called The Art of Possibility. And in the book, he, he talks about the reality that as Westerners, as Western thinkers, we have we have learned to live with a certain kind of burdensome anxiety. Can I get an amen? Because most of us right here, we, we do this. And, and he used this as an example. He said, most of us in our culture, we were taught very early that there is virtue in creating lists of things to do. Because of all things, we want to be industrious people. We want to be people who get it all done. And so we create lists. And even there are people in this room that, that literally create lists. You have lists and lists and lists and lists and there are other people in the room, you just do it in your head. But all of us have been taught that somehow creating lists are important. And so we're going to make a list of all the things. If I'm going to have a good day, if I'm going to accomplish, if things are going to move forward, these are the things that we'll need to get done today. And then as the day unfolds, we might check off a couple, but most of us, if we are typical, we add more than we take off. And the list never gets shorter. And what do we do with the list? We roll it over to the next day. Xander says in his book, we are the only culture on the planet that emotionally, mentally wakes up in debt every single morning. And it is a self-imposed reality. It is made up. So you and I wake up in the morning and we think, I've got more to do than I can ever get to. I can't possibly handle what's on my plate. And it creates in us a kind of depression and anxiety. And that impression and anxiety begins to lash out at the people around us. And why are we lashing out? Because we're not very happy. Because we're in debt emotionally. And Xander says, it is all made up. Why don't you decide to look at life differently 
Instead of telling yourself that you're in debt and overwhelmed and you'll never get it all done, how about this? How about you wake up in the morning and say, it is my God-given privilege and right to see if I could move the ball forward a little in all of the areas of my life. I'm going to love somebody better. I'm going to do something good. I'm going to pick up something. I'm going to try to patch something up. I'm going to spend my day just trying to move the ball forward a little bit. And when I do, I'm going to celebrate and celebrate and celebrate and celebrate. What would be wrong with that? Not just in our individual lives, but in our community. And when we begin to think about the incredible challenges facing us in our world. I love the story in Luke chapter 9 as Jesus begins to tell us uh, about the crowd. A a couple of things, um, and I'm almost done. Everybody still okay? Good. Has it been too weird for you so far? Thank you. I appreciate that. I know you wouldn't tell me the truth. (laughs) But I will read the emails later. (laughs) In Luke 9, Jesus is interacting with a crowd, and I want you to know a couple things about this. First of all, I want you to know this is the only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels. And since it's the only miracle recorded in all four Gospels, it seems to me that's a message from the Gospel writers saying this is a formational thing that's happening here. It, it's more than just its own story. This has very deep implications into the life of humanity and what we're supposed to learn. The second thing that I want you to know about this is that it's placed in an interesting context in Luke's story. So, so what has happened is that Jesus has sent out the disciples. They've gone out and they've been doing the work of the kingdom. They've been out doing the stuff. That's very interesting, isn't it, <laughs> to me? That's very interesting. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is ground central. This is Jesus sending the first disciples to go build the, the church. That They are doing the original, primary, foundational work of the church. And that's the context. So they've just done all of that work. They've just gone. Jesus said, hey, go get them. And they all go, and now they've all come back. And they're waiting to, I don't know what they're waiting to do. I, I assume some things. I assume if you started a business and, and you got your you know, brain trust together and you said, okay, we're going to go do some market research. I want you all to get out there and I want you to spend a couple of weeks and then I want you to come back. And, and when you come back, we're going to have a long talk about how we're going to run this thing, how we're going to do this, how we're going to make millions of dollars, whatever it is. I assume that's part of what's going on here. Jesus has sent them out. They've come back. They've gathered back together. So contextually... That's what's happening. What's going to happen next is that Peter's going to make his confession as to who Christ is. That's how Luke sets it up. They've just come back from this initial evangelism, discipleship, whatever kind of trip, church building, whatever you want to call it. And and then at the end of this little episode, Peter's going to say, you are the Christ. You know, who do people say that I am? Some say you're the prophet. Some say you're Moses. Come back to life. But who do you say that you are the Christ, the son of the living God? And so right squeezed between these two massive things is this little story that's recorded for us in Luke chapter 9. Listen to how Luke tells it. When the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done, and then he took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. But the crowds learned about it, and they followed him, He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. And late in the afternoon, the twelve came to him and said, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are in a remote place here. And he replied, you give them something to eat. And they answered, we have only five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. About 5,000 men were there. But he said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of 50 each. And the disciples did so, and everyone sat. And taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and he broke them. And then he gave them to the disciples to distribute to the people. And they all ate, and they were all satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. There's so many things I love about this story. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to just think for a minute about this opportunity. So here's what's going on. Jesus, CEO of Christianity, <laughs> has gotten his VPs together. And he said to them, we're going to do some market research. And he sent them out to do 
their work, and they've come back, and now they're planning a corporate retreat. You get, you get the tone of this? They're going to they're gonna evaluate what has happened. This is a strategic planning session, and he's going to take them away to a quiet place, and they choose the little village of Bethsaida. Now, Bethsaida sits on the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee. It's just at the northern end of the Golan Heights, if you're familiar with the geography at all. It's adjacent almost immediately to the, to the little village of Caesarea Philippi, uh, which is important because that's where Peter makes his confession. And so it's a remote area. There's not a lot up there, even today. It's very little uh, uh, civilization up there. So he takes them to Corbin. We're going to get away. We're going to bond as a group. We're going to strategize. We're going to plan. We are going to lay the very foundation for Christianity, which is going to change the world. So let's get together. You are the very, you are the view, you you are the most important people, and this is the most important work. And we're told in the other Gospels that as the boat leaves and begins to move away from the civilized, which is the western side of the Sea of Galilee, towards the more remote area of the eastern side and the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee, that the people just walk around the bank. The mass just follow the boat. It's not a big, the Sea of Galilee is a lake, not a big lake. And so they just follow the boat, and, and they're, they're waiting when the boat gets to the other side. The crowd is invasive. The crowd is pushing themselves into the space where they don't belong. The crowd is interrupting the business of the kingdom of God. You can't get more foundational and fundamental than this moment. This is where it all began. This is where it starts. This is the first little foray into changing the world in Jesus' name. They've come back together. They're going to do you know, tell your story. Okay, this is what you should have said, what you should have done. Maybe don't do it that way next time. Hey, good job. Way to go. This is the corporate retreat they're heading for. And the crowd goes before them and waits for them. I want to make three observations, and then we'll wrap this thing up. The overall observation is this. The crowd is invasive. The neediness of the world is invasive if we have the slightest sensitivity at all. Amen? So point number one, the neediness of the world invades their work. They've been planning They've been setting up some deadlines. They've been writing in their to-do list. They've all had their calendars out as they rode across on the boat. (laughs) They've all set some goals of growth and expansion. (laughs) They're planning to purchase a headquarters and remodel some offices. Amen. (laughs) And the crowd invades the work. seems to me that when you begin to love Jesus, some things are going to get in the way of your work. It seems to me that sometimes you and I, because of our culture, our world, that we have made work more important than almost anything else. And just so you don't feel like I'm picking on you, this story is set against the work of the church. And sometimes we get so busy doing church that we forget why we're here. We, we get so busy celebrating who we are as an organization and our strategic plans and our hopes and our dreams that we forget that all of that is about one thing. It is about the neediness beyond these walls. Are we together on that? But Marley, you were a good man of business. Business! Because it ain't just a church, is it? Humankind is my business. Empathy, compassion, care, love, grace. That's my business. That's what I'm created to do. You got to make money to live. But when the neediness of the world begins to invade my business, then something's wrong with my priorities. When the neediness of my family is invading my business, something's wrong with my priorities. When the neediness of my neighbors is invading my business, something's wrong. 
with my priorities. Only miracle that appears, it appears in all four Gospels because it's foundational to its truth. Number two, they not only invaded their work, they invaded their rest. So, so in one of the Gospels it says Jesus took them away to a solitary place so they could rest. He was taking them on retreat. He was getting them away from all the responsibility. You can mess with my work, but you better not mess with my rest. I need these weekends away. I can't volunteer because the beach renews my soul. I can't serve at the church because I only get a short amount of time away from my work in order to recover myself. Anybody see some problems here? Now, it wasn't that Jesus thought that rest wasn't important because he said to the disciples, we're going to get away and rest. It's important that we do this. We need to do this. (laughs) But when the neediness of the crowd invades the rest, it becomes a story that gets told in all four Gospels. Because sometimes we worship our rest We're tired people, aren't we? Are you tired? Some of you right now are saying, please keep preaching. That's the best sleep I've gotten in a long time. I'm sitting in a dark room in a comfortable chair. Nobody's trying to talk to me. Nobody's asking me anything. Just go on and on. We are tired people. Do you ever think about how our ancestors would look at us? I don't mean our ancient ancestors. I I just mean the people that lived a few years. Like, you know, like pioneer people. I mean, you would have a hard time convincing them of how physically exhausted we are, wouldn't you? I had to turn both handles to get the water. I mean, they've got that new faucet that you just touch it and it comes on. Because we can't be doing this. We're tired people. I just need to touch the faucet because I can't lift both arms up there. (laughs) I've got to go to the grocery store. (laughs) Don't you think our ancestors would be like, grocery store? Whoa, whoa, whoa. You mean they got all the food in one place? You just get a basket and you walk up and down, dump stuff? Scan your card, go home? Let me tell you, this is called a hoe. (laughs) We had to to dig stuff. If you were going to eat, you had to go out there and dig it up. You do know food grows in the ground, right? No, comes in plastic wrap. (laughs) And not only comes in plastic wrap, you don't even have to wash it anymore. Because we can't get our arms up there. (laughs) Because we're tired. We're tired people. I've been at my computer all week. (sighs) Sometimes I have to refill my coffee mug. I'm exhausted. This week, the air conditioner went out. I mean, do we listen to ourselves? But we prize our rest. We've created a culture. We've created a culture where we idolize our work and we idolize our rest. And the neediness of the crowd will invade our work. It will absolutely invade our work. And it will absolutely invade our recreation and our rest. If we are sensitive at all to the needs of what is happening in our world, the crowd will be setting in the places where we desire to rest, waiting for us to respond to them. It invaded their work. It invaded their rest. And it invaded their desire to be philosophical about life. I just imagine they must have been talking about some great things. I mean, right on the heels of this, Luke creates that story. He places that story of Peter and the great confession. You are the Christ, the Son. They want to talk about big stuff. 
I, I've gotten involved in some uh, pastoral mentoring opportunities. A couple of weeks, I'm going to fly out to Florida, and we'll sit down with a bunch of pastors from across the country and just try to answer some questions and think about some things together. And, and uh, on the one side of things, I think it's great, fun, and interesting, and engaging. And, and on the other side, I think it's like the height of stupidity. Because, you know, do you ever think about, I mean, because I don't know if you've ever been around a bunch of theologians who are talking about life. It's not always very practical. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it has a tendency to go a little ivory tower, you know what I'm talking about? As we start talking about trends and sociology and millennials and Gen Xers and the nuns and We cite studies, you know, studies tell us, ooh, hmm, hmm. I think that's going on with the disciples here. I think they're tempted to move into that place where we talk philosophically about life, and we talk philosophically about God, and we talk philosophically about our theology, and, and we theorize a lot of things, and we pontificate a lot of things, and we do a lot of judging, and we do a lot of critiquing. I think that there's a temptation to, to let, let's make some overarching statement about what's best and what matters most. But when the boat bumps up against the shore, there are very real people with very needy lives who don't care two cents for the philosophies of the church. Here's what they care about. They're hungry. They're hungry and they want to eat. So when Jesus steps out of the boat, it is an interruption of their work, it is an interruption of their rest, and it is an interruption of their philosophical approach. And Jesus welcomes the crowd with compassion. One of the Gospels says, seeing that they were sheep without a shepherd... Jesus began to teach them. And it's a very short amount of time before the disciples who are still mad. You can feel it. Send the crowd away. Send the crowd away. It's getting late. There's not very much to eat out here. Send them away so they can get something to eat. Now, this is why it's in all four Gospels. You give them something to eat. Don't let your work be an excuse for not feeding the neediness of the world and the crowd. Don't let your rest be an excuse for not feeding the neediness of the world and the crowd. Don't let your philosophical approach to life be an excuse for not meeting the neediness and the hunger of the world in which you and I live. Because folks, someday we'll die and we'll be done. And it seems to me That what will really matter are the little things we did today to move the ball forward just a little bit. We can't fix everything. We don't know what the outcomes are. But we could do our best today, couldn't we? I mean, couldn't we walk out of this place a different church than we walked in? Couldn't we realize that that, that we're not about gathering on a weekend? We gather on a weekend to get empowered to meet the neediness of the people in our neighborhoods and communities and in our world. Amen? We get together to open the Word of God to to shift our perspectives because what we're doing today is called vision casting. Technically speaking, we're raising the vision of the church. Everybody with me on that? Have you all had your vision raised? (laughs) I hope so because I'm out of material. But you may or may not know this. Vision leaks. So if we raise a vision today and we're all going, I'm going to be different. Let's go to lunch. (laughs) Because vision leaks. So we get together every week to renew the vision. Don't forget. Don't forget Jesus loves you. Don't forget you're a part of the plan. Don't forget that it matters. It matters what you say to the person next to you. It matters what you do at work. It matters what you do at school. It matters, it matters, it matters. It matters that you serve faithfully week after week, year after year. Someday you'll get a lounge named after you. (laughs) 
But folks, it matters. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who could tell you a story about Jim and Fran Hastings because they shook their hand one morning at the front door of a church and handed them a bulletin and said, I love you, I've been praying for you, what's happening to you? I guarantee you, I guarantee you, what are you and I doing? Because we are here to change the world. And we can be so distracted by our work that we can feel that the church, that the neediness of the world and another phone call and another volunteer opportunity is invading our work. You are not a person of business. Humankind is your business. Now, I know that you got to go to work, and I know that you are good at it. And God bless you. Don't quit. Just don't lose your perspective. Amen? Amen. Just don't worship the work instead of the God who gives you the work. When the neediness of the world invades your rest, then you might have to sacrifice that weekend away or, heaven forbid, you don't get to put the new thing on the jet ski or something has to happen different. Nothing wrong with rest. Just don't worship it. Just don't worship it. And by all means, don't let yourself live in some philosophical ivory tower where your thoughts never make it to the streets where there's no practical, where you can talk about this all day, but this never happens. Let me tell you something. Don't talk, do. Just do the work, be the loving person, and trust that the right things will come out the other side. Amen? Because you and I know nothing about outcomes. Nothing. You have a little card that was put in your folder this morning. There's extra ones. We're committing together to say, this is not about us. We raise money every week to operate and do things like this and, and, and you know, run Montrose Church and Pasadena Brazil campus, all that stuff. It's worthwhile, it matters. We serve, we serve literally hundreds of people every week. Thank you for that. But this is faith promise. This is where we are giving away every single dollar. Every single dollar that comes in in faith promise, we give to other ministries. And so... What we're asking you is, before you leave, we're going to show you a little video. I'm going to say a prayer over you. And you're going to take that, mark it. You're going to drop one end of it at the ushers. There's baskets at the back as you exit today. If you haven't prayed about it and thought about it yet, you can pray about it this week. You don't even have to tell us. You can go online and do it online. I don't know how technical you are. But folks, the neediness of the crowd is not an invasion of our work. It is not an invasion of our rest. It is not an invasion of our philosophy. The neediness of the crowd is our work. It is who we are. It is who we were created to be. Watch this video, please. The Reverend Billy Graham once said, give me five minutes with a person's checkbook and I'll tell you where their heart is. We don't like to talk about money, especially in church. We've all seen or experienced firsthand the troubles money can bring. It can be the cause of pain, depression, anxiety, and we understand why it's hard to talk about, but we need to. The truth is money has incredible power and potential in the kingdom of God. At Montrose Church, we know that we don't have all the answers to the problems facing our community and our world. So our strategy is to partner with organizations who are experts in their field and are already on the ground serving people in need. They don't need us to strategize and tell them what to do. They're already doing amazing work, but they do need our financial support. In 2015, we started Faith Promise. Faith Promise is a fund separate from tithes and offerings. While your tithes and offerings pay for the expenses and operations of Montrose Church, 100% of the money you give to Faith Promise goes outside our walls directly to the people and organizations with whom we partner. The money goes directly to Special Olympics and Tierra del Sol, two organizations serving our friends with special needs and giving them an opportunity to thrive and accomplish goals they never thought possible. The money goes directly to Young Life, Stars, Inverted Arts, and Phoenix House, 
organizations meeting the very real needs of the youth in our community. The money goes directly to Elizabeth House and the Crisis Pregnancy Clinic, who meet the needs of mothers and children in their most vulnerable times. And the money goes directly to missionaries, heavenly treasures, and our friends in Swaziland, who are on the ground across the world serving people with the greatest needs. We believe Faith Promise has the potential to change lives both here in our community and across the globe. And we believe every member of our church has a responsibility and a role in Faith Promise. Do you know how much it costs to feed a child in Swaziland for a day? 50 cents, only 50 cents, which means $15 a month keeps a child from going hungry. You don't have to be a millionaire to make a difference. Every dollar counts. Traditionally, in these kinds of videos, this is the time where we ask you to give up a Starbucks once a week or sacrifice one meal out at a restaurant to give to Faith Promise. But we believe this is more important than that. In our lives, we have so many things that we subscribe to every month without even thinking about it. Netflix has never had to run a commercial saying, give up two Starbucks drinks a month to pay for Netflix. We pay for it because it's important to us, which leads us back to the Reverend Billy Graham. Before you give to Faith Promise, before you commit a single dollar, take five minutes to look at how you spend your money every month. Where is your heart? God, would you help us? Would you touch our hearts? With the things that matter most to you. Would you let your Holy Spirit move in this place? thankful for the smart, diligent, hardworking people that you've blessed into the life of this church. Help us to be ever grateful, but to never worship our accomplishments or our work. Forgive us being tired all the time. We're so tired because of the condition of our inner world. Teach us to reorder it so that it would be pleasing to you. Don't let us live in ivory towers. Don't let us approach life and the world and people around us philosophically. Teach us to do the hard work, the nitty gritty work, the street level work of this conversation in this moment, this act of sacrifice and unselfishness. And across this room and across this congregation, challenge us put others first and to be faithful. The neediness of the crowd is not an invasion. It is our business. Help us to live in that reality. I pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said together. Will you stand with me? I just want to tell you a couple things. I love you. Thank you. And I'm proud of who you are and I'm proud of your hearts and I'm proud of how you serve. We can change the world. At least we can do what God intends for you and I to do. 
at least we can do the works he's prepared in advance for us to do. Let's do it faithfully and let's be thankful. Let's be filled with gratitude and let's be filled with joy and let's celebrate that we get a privilege and an opportunity together to celebrate week after week, to be the body of Christ, to be heaven on earth. God bless you. Thanks for being here. Heaven is calling for you to come higher, to see everything from a new point of view. Be seated with Jesus in heavenly places. From this perspective, everything is made new. There is lightning and thunder, miracles.